You know, before I came here uh, to cover your event, I w we were at one of the encampments, and I was interviewing uh, somebody there. He's homeless. He's with his girlfriend there. Uh, they've been there for eight months. They were just kind of finally getting, um, I guess, making a home of it. And it was striking to me because, like so many other places, they're facing the city coming in and sweeping them out on Monday. And uh, I was thinking to myself, if all the people uh, ordering from Amazon, <laughs> you know, all over the country, uh, and, you know, I, I've ordered from Amazon and this and that, uh, there's a real cognitive disconnect between the uh, consumption of comfort and, and um, uh, timeliness and easy delivery and these things with who, it, who are its victims. You know, it's not that simplistic, but at the end of the day, what Amazon does, uh, it's become, we as a society want instant, instant gratification, but it's making it so working people and human beings uh, cannot afford to have a roof over their head. So what role do people uh, in this cognitive disconnect we have that are not just Amazon, but enjoying these technological benefits, uh, should more people wake up to who it's harming, not just the homeless, but the people at this event that are, you know, getting evicted or <laughs> deciding between medicine this month versus uh, paying their rent. Uh, what do people uh, who are kind of asleep to this need to know uh, in order to kind of wake up? I think the uh I think the best way that we can actually get people uh, to be activated, you know, like really know about what's going on and what they can do to help the uh, struggle of people who are maybe in, a, in worse situations than, than themselves is to actually build political movements like what we're doing here, which is uh, organizing the tenants themselves. And the tenants are, uh, you know, trying to get other uh, tenants and other homeowners as part of their struggle. And you saw how many people signed the petition today, which is in solidarity with the tenants who are fighting against demolition and eviction. And undoubtedly, uh, we know we have a system where uh, some people benefit from the system and some people that don't benefit at all. And then on top, you have the people who benefit the most. And so I think uh, while it is important for people to know uh, what happens to their consumption behavior. You know, obviously we know also cell phones uh, rely on absolute uh, and utter exploitation of uh, African workers, some mm -hmm. of them children in Africa because they have to mine the uh, elements. So I think... And uh, electric cars. And electric cars, absolutely. But I think uh, as a socialist, this is what I would say. I don't think we can hold out a vision, and I, and I don't think we should hold out a vision for society that relies on any kind of rejection of technological advances because technological advances can be harnessed to make people's lives better. But it is not a neutral question how technology is deployed and what kind of technology is deployed and what happens to people in the process of developing that technology is entirely a political question. There's nothing inevitable about technology and exploitation, technology and inequality. It is totally possible, I believe, to have a future society uh, you know, uh, form, formed uh, on the basis of socialism where we can have technological ad advances more than we have now actually, much more of an exploration and research of science and clinical research uh, it, but it would be a society where all of that would be put to use to benefit the maximum number of human beings, not to enrich a Jeff Bezos or a Bill Gates or whoever billionaire. You know, it would be meant to uh, make people's lives better. Just to give you an example of why I don't think we should take a sort of a Luddite view of technology is one of the most simple, I, you know, I, when I te teach economics in the classroom, I often ask my students, Econ 101 students, what do you think is the most amazing uh, invention of uh, under capitalism that actually has changed people's lives dramatically. And, you know, often my students or, you know, or young will say uh, like some iPhone app or something fancy that I, I haven't even heard of. And I always say, no, none of these things. It's the washing machine. <laughs> if you can imagine the transform transformative effect of something like a washing machine can have in the daily drudgery that hundreds of millions of women face on every continent in the world, you can imagine uh, how much it improves people's lives because you, uh, rather than having to do it with your hands, you do it with a machine and it completely transforms your quality of life. But under capitalism, even though that is such a low level invention at this point, the washing machine is not accessible to the masses around the nation. 
That is not because technology has lagged behind. That is because the system works in such a way that it does not harness technology to improve the living standards of people everywhere. It is the, the purpose of technology is the same as the purpose of science under capitalism, which is to enrich the pockets of a few people above. So in other words, as far as Amazon is concerned, I think, I mean, if you look at, first of all, if you look at the scale of it, Amazon, uh, half, I think, I believe half of US households are prime subscribers. Most people I know, in myself included, you know, we have bought from Amazon, we watch, uh, uh, you know, sh television shows on Amazon Prime and so on. Uh, I think that I would, I would remind people to say that Jeff Bezos did not invent online shopping. He certainly did not invent the internet. It was researchers who did it because they were in creative pursuit. They were not the ones who made the millions and certainly not the billions. So rather than rejecting the idea of technological advances like online shopping, I think what we should strive for is a society where we can have, all human beings can have the benefits of technological advances, but without the exploitation. And obviously it seems like a pipe dream because that's not going to happen today. But how we do that is by building movements today. So in the here and now, my concrete response how do we uh, address the inequities related to Amazon rather than, uh, you know, every, some individual households stopping, uh, you know, buying from Amazon? And it's fine if you want to do it. That's that's, that's your choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and, and it, is, it is laudable in every way. Absolutely, you should do whatever you can and should do in your personal lives. But always know that that is not what's changing society. What's changing society is when millions of people come together and fight back. So I think what we should do, if we want to address the problems that are being meted out by Amazon and Jeff Bezos, we should fight to organize the wor warehouse workers and tech workers into unions. We should have the, a major unionizing drive in the logistics sector, make sure Amazon pays a living wage, and its anti-union and union busting tactics, which, and none of this is going to be easy unless we actually fight back. And there is no doubt there are examples in history where boycotts have played a big role in for in uh, social struggle, the Montgomery bus boycott being an important example. And certainly we should engage in that kind of boycott if it uh, aids the movement. But individuals by themselves changing their consumption behavior, as laudable as it is, does not build movements by itself. And that's why we need to, we need all these people also on the front lines of a street struggle. Mm -hmm. And I know my viewers would ask this, uh, do you have any interest in running for anything of higher office? Well, uh, to give some background to answer that question, I, as a member of Socialist Alternative, and Socialist Alternative is a nationwide organization of social and economic justice activists. Uh, as a member of Socialist Alternative, I did not decide myself that I did not wake up one day and say, I'm going to run for office and Socialist Alternative is going to campaign for me. No, what we, what we are is an example of what I think a working class Part, political party should look like, which is that we are a democratic organization where every member has a right to participate in a discussion and debate. And collectively through that democratic process, we decide should we run an election campaign, what the campaign platform should be, who the candidate should be, and uh, you know how we should wage that campaign. So in other words... Wait a minute, I, you're talking about democracy? Yes, I'm talking about oh, real democracy. Oh, what a thing. Yes, what a thing. yes. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, I, to be honest with you and your viewers, uh, I, I was uh, stunned and somewhat horrified when the organization said, I think we, we think we sh you should be the candidate. And it was a democratic decision, unfortunately for me, <laughs> unfortunately for democracy. Uh, and, and the reason I'm saying that is not out of any self-praise, but, uh, but to demonstrate to ordinary people that that's what we need, because that's how you get accountability. That's how you get elected representatives who will continue to fight alongside social movements. We don't want... We don't want working class organizations to run their own candidates and for those candidates when they get elected to turn around and serve the interests of corporate, uh, you know, corporations and, and the wealthy. We want our people to get elected and then serve the interests of the movement, continue to use their office as an amplifier for social movements. And I can't tell you the number of times political pundits, political operatives and other pol you know, politicians have come to me and said, and also the media, corporate media writes about me every day saying, oh, she, she does not behave like a proper elected official. She still thinks she's an activist, so maybe she should be out there as an activist. But look at the impact we have had 
by taking no corporate money, by using my office as a base for social struggle, we are really activating hundreds, thousands of people in Seattle to fight for their own rights. And the meeting that we had today, we had over, you know nearly 200 people here in solidarity with the tenants, and they are fighting for their own rights by, by organizing their own struggles. That's what we need, not some messiah from the top who's going to solve our problems because that will never happen. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank I appreciate you. it. Hope you enjoyed that interview. Come watch us live right now, statuscoup.com slash live or on facebook.com slash Jordan Sheridan or Jordan Sheridan on Periscope. Come watch us live right now. Hope you enjoyed that last video. Hop on over to statuscoup.com where you can sign up for our email list and become a member for as low as five to ten dollars a month. Membership is how we grow. That's statuscoup.com slash join. And remember, join our email list so we can grow the revolution with you.